Well, I, I've heard a couple of people say, well, I'm here that Holland is about 20 years behind the United States. So take a look at what's happening in the United States. That's what you're going through. Uh, I know the U.S. situation much better, of course, but what happened there is very instructive about the connection between democracy and education. Uh, the uh, a activism in the 1960s, it caused uh, a lot of distress among elite circles across the spectrum, uh, right to sort of, you know, what's called liberal in the United States, basically social democratic, a lot of uh, concern. Uh, there was, uh, in fact, there's a very important book that came out about it that you ought to take a look at. It's called The Crisis of Democracy. It's published by the Trilateral Commission. Trilaterals, Europe, United States, uh, Japan, the three industrial democracies. And their leading, I think it was Michel Crozier, was the European representative. Uh, the concern of the book is that there's too much democracy. The, uh, th these, incidentally, are kind of liberal internationalists. Uh, for example, the Carter administration came completely from their ranks. It's not the right wing. Uh, the right wing is much harsher. These are liberal internationalists in the three trilateral de democratic areas, uh, concerned about the fact that in the 60s, in all the industrial world, uh, there were all, uh, popular, popular uprisings of one sort or another. Uh, people were asking for their rights. People were entering the political arena. Uh, people who are usually passive and you know, obedient, apathetic, were entering the public arena and uh, uh, agitating for their own interests and concerns. Uh, students, uh, women, uh, minorities, you know, all kind of people. And that's uh, bad news. Uh, that's, uh, uh, it, it creates a crisis of democracy. And what the participants said is we have to have more moderation in democracy. Uh, these people have to go back to where they belong, you know, just being observers, passive, let the serious people run things and so on. Uh, and in particular, they were concerned about students, of course, because there were student activism all over. And uh, what they argued was that, I'm now using their words, not mine, that the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young failed. The schools, the universities, the churches, they were not carrying out appropriate indoctrination of the young. And something has to be done to reverse this. And there were other proposals for other bad segments, uh, women, others, and so on. Well, what do you do with regard to the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young? You have to eliminate the options that young pe students or young people had that enabled them to engage in activism. Well, one of the, uh, those options was they just had too much freedom. So the 1960s were kind of an expansive period, a period of economic growth. Uh, you know, an 18-year-old kid could say, I'm going to take off a couple of years and become become involved in activism, I'll go back and continue my life. You got to end that. And what happened right at that point uh, was a number of measures were introduced, uh, including uh, what's going on here, including raising tuitions. Uh, so uh, uh, right at that point, college tuition started going up pretty sharply. I, mean, I can't prove that it was a immediate consequence, but it certainly coincided. Uh, and other measures were taken which restricted, which made the uh, uh, colleges and the schools more, uh, you know, more like uh, the Marine Corps. And so by now there's uh, the programs in the schools, which are called No Child Left Behind, the Bush, Obama programs. Uh, those are Marine Corps programs. The kids are trained to pass tests, not to think, you know, like I've talked to teachers, sixth grade teachers and so on, who tell me that uh, you know, after some class a kid came up and was interested in something and wanted to know how to pursue it. And the teacher is compelled to tell the child, uh, you can't do that because you have to work on passing this test we're going to have uh, next week. And the child has to pass. And the teacher's salary depends on whether the child passes. So the uh, discipline works in intricate ways. Of course, it, it turns children into automata. Uh, going back to that Humboldt 
quote I mentioned before. It turns them into a, a craftsman that may be able to produce something beautiful, but on command. Uh, so uh, without uh, personal initiative, without uh, pursuit of your own interests, without individual creativity, uh, uh, just uh, on command. That's what a test is. And if at the college level, uh, a, in the United States, a student leaving college now typically has, unless they come from a very rich family, have a huge debt. Well, they're trapped for life. You have a big debt, you're trapped for life. You may want to, say you're a lawyer, you might want to go into public interest law, but you can't. You've got to go to work for a corporate law firm. There's no other way to pay off that debt. And it's the same kind of across the board. So these are disciplinary techniques uh, uh, on, in the hands of, uh, you know, initiated by, in part by the business world, which is very class conscious, always fighting a bitter class war, and in part on the, uh, from the general intellectual community, which is closely linked to them and does not want to see uh, freedom and independence. I mean, exceptions, of course, but uh, overwhelmingly. Uh, and I think this is happening all over the world. And it's interesting to see the different forms it's taking. So, for example, a couple of months ago, I happened to be giving talks in uh, Mexico at the uh, National University, a big, uh, big university, a couple hundred thousand students, uh, a pretty high-level university, uh, you know, good students, uh, very good work going on, reasonable facilities, you know, not like uh, Harvard, but uh, very good. Uh, it's free. Ten years ago, the government tried to uh, raise tuition. There was a national student strike, which was so effective that the government had to back off. And uh, in fact, uh, the main administrative building on campus is still occupied by students who turned it into an activist center. The government hasn't called the cops to throw them out. You know. uh, well, that was Mexico, poor country. I went from there to Berkeley, California, uh, richest part of the world. They are, uh, the, had a great university system, gr the best public education system in the world. Five really, minutes for both answers. Yeah, it was really first rate. They're destroying it. Uh, the major universities now have tuitions at the level of the uh, practically at the level of the fancy private colleges in the East, the big endowments. Uh, it'll be big fancy colleges for the rich. They'll probably privatize them. And the rest of the system, which was a fine system, will be reduced to uh, training, you know, the training people, vocational training. Well, that's happening in the richest place in the world. Uh, Mexico, uh, relatively poor country, they're maintaining a free, a high quality education system. I think those examples like that suffice to show that these are not economic problems. Uh, there are other problems. There are issues that have to do with, uh, the, with discipline, social control, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, they can be resisted. I mean, if students in Mexico, which is a pretty brutal state, I should say, you don't want to mess with the police in Mexico. You know. But they did, and they won and uh, had a, a big achievement. Uh, well, you know, in much more free countries, it's a lot more possible. But I think what's happening all across the board is an effort to uh, essentially privatize education and turn it into more of a, a system of discipline and domination and prevent the, uh, you know, this dangerous conception of uh, free uh, thought and uh, uh, initiative that uh, it comes straight out of the enlightenment. Now, go back to what your ideal university <coughs> should be. Uh, I don't say it's an ideal, but one of the reasons I've stayed at MIT for 55 years is I think it comes about as close to that ideal as, uh, as any I know. And it's, it's kind of interesting because it was, it was for most of the time I've been there, it's been funded by the Pentagon. But the Pentagon wants a free and open university. Because the Pentagon, like an enlightened state generally, is interested in the overall state of the economy in the next in the next generation. So a lot of the contemporary high-tech economy 
that comes out of Pentagon funding wasn't for any particular purpose. It was just, you know, develop the economy of the future. And uh, uh, the end result is uh, it's a pretty free and open place. Uh, it, it works just the way I think it ought to. So, for example, one, there's one famous physicist there, died recently, but a world-famous physicist who was teaching uh, freshman courses, introductory courses, like a lot of the faculty does. And he was kind of famous for uh, when he was asked by students, what are we going to cover in this semester? He, his routine answer was, it doesn't matter what we cover, it matters what you discover. So if we don't cover anything, you'll figure it out on your own, but see what you can figure out. And students are expected to challenge. Like they're not expected to take notes and repeat it in an exam, but to tell you you're wrong. And they do, you know. <laughs> they're supposed to stand up with their own ideas, you know, challenge what's said, work on their own, and uh, what can they discover? Uh, I think that's a lot more important than studying philosophy. Uh, philosophy is, if, if you can teach philosophy that way, fine, but you can teach physics that way too. Uh, it's interesting that as the Institute MIT has become, as, as the character of it and the funding of it have shifted from uh, Pentagon funding to uh, commercial funding, it's gotten more narrow and limited. Uh, commercial, you know, say a, a, a drug company, when they give a grant, they don't want to create the economy of the future. They want something that they can make money from next year. So the effect is to uh, make uh, research and with it teaching uh, a narrower, more concentrated, more short-term, short more applied, and also to introduce secrecy. Uh, during the period when it was Pentagon funded, it was entirely open. There was, there was no secrecy. I mean, there were military labs next to the Institute, but even they were pretty open. Like my wife worked in a military lab, I worked in the research lab of electronics, but there was complete uh, interchange between them. As it's becoming more commercialized, uh, it's be there's more secrecy introduced. Now you can't uh, uh, impose secrecy by, uh, you know, by administrative requirement. One minute. Yeah, but you can do it by, in indirect ways, by making it clear that if you let information out, you're not going to get your contract renewed. So it does introduce secrecy all the way down to the student level. Um, there have even been cases where students uh, refused to answer questions in exams uh, where they knew the answer because they were bound by an instructor somewhere not to release the information. That never happened under the Pentagon system, uh, contrary to what a lot of people think. So I think that's, you know, I wouldn't say it's an ideal university, but it's comes pretty close to what a university ought to be like.